Good evening and welcome to the third in the 1973-1974 Library Science Forum Series. Other speakers in this series have been Judith F. Krug, who spoke to us on intellectual freedom, and Howard Hitchens, Jr., who addressed us on the subject educational technology in the 70s, and on March the 5th, 1974, we'll hear from Jean Carl, who will speak to us on the topic from here to there in children's books. And then the last speaker of this series, March 26, 1974, will be Howard Peckham, who will have as his topic, The Fun of Managing an Historical Library. Our speaker this evening is Mr. Evan Farber, librarian of the Lilly Library at Earlham College, Richmond, Indiana. Mr. Farber has had a long and distinguished career in academic librarianship, starting first of all as an instructor in political science at the University of Massachusetts, and then holding various offices in libraries, uh, being a documents librarian, a serials librarian, and uh, a specialist in the instruction in the use of libraries. He has in recent years been director of a seminar on non-Western studies for college librarians at Columbia University School of Library Service. He has been active on the local scene and on the national scene in library organizations and is, uh, was in 1970-72 a member of the ALA Council. His list of consultantships is uh, too lengthy for me to review here for you this evening. He has consulted in the area of new buildings, in services, in collections, and instructional programs. His list of publications is equally as long and includes, among other things, that household word among the household of librarians, the Farber list of books for college libraries. And he has told me uh, this evening that he has just finished editing a series of essays on the academic library uh, dedicated to Guy R. Lyle, uh, to be published shortly by Scarecrow Press. Mr. Farber. Thank you. <clears throat> what I'm going to uh, talk about tonight is a, uh, a sort of a pastiche of uh, experiences and uh, thoughts and uh, ideas that I've had and uh, keep having. Um, experiences and thoughts and ideas which in the past few months within the past year, certainly, have uh, been catalyzed by a particular idea which I'm going to present at the end. And uh, this pastiche of, of different things, uh, I hope will fit in very nicely. And uh, I hope it'll all be pulled together. It'll come out not so much as a uh, patchwork quilt, but a, but a uh, coherent kind of uh, set of ideas. I, I honestly didn't know what to talk about at first when the, I was asked for a topic, a title, and so the uh, obvious thing to do was to uh, choose a title that was uh, appealing in a sense, uh, but would permit me to go what, whichever direction I wanted. So that's why I chose something like, uh, I'm not even sure what the title is. So, <laughs> college library prospects and problems or something like that. But it is going to be about the college library. And it's particularly about the, the library in the liberal arts college. And some of my points will relate to my particular situation. That is the situation at, uh, at Earlham College, library at Earlham College, because after all, I've been there now for 11 years and I know it well and I think it's a pretty good library. And uh, I think we're doing things in ways that lots of libraries could uh, at least should look at and perhaps emulate. Uh, but a number of the points I'm going to make are of wider interest. And uh, most, I hope, are applicable to a, a wider group. I've also worked in other libraries, as was pointed out, in university libraries and uh, teachers' college libraries. Uh, 
uh, in uh, large universities and small university libraries. And so I have some basis for comparison. Also, being a consultant to a number of different kinds of libraries, I'm able to see what way other places do things. And um, these have all helped me shape, uh, shape my ideas. But I'm still going to talk about the, the liberal arts college, not only because I work there, uh, I work there because I believe in what the liberal arts college is trying to do. And uh, this is one of the reasons I, I enjoy my job. The liberal arts college, I think, is a, um, and I don't mean to deprecate uh, other kinds of uh, educational institutions, but I think the liberal arts college does a particular kind of, of job uh, uh, of training individuals shaping their intellectual and uh, aesthetic and perceptive abilities, uh, cultivating a certain kind of uh, imaginative artistic syndrome to make them what I consider worthwhile people. The, um, in order to do this, to do the kind of thing that a liberal arts college is intending, was intended to do, and which many liberal arts colleges are doing, uh, libraries are essential. There's not much question about that. One of the major things that a liberal arts college tries to do is to train individuals to be able to cope with the world, not just uh, the world as he knows it now, but the world as he's going to encounter it uh, years ahead. And obviously in something like this, the library is especially important. We just quoted a couple of things. This is from Samuel Baskin's book called Higher Education, Some Newer Developments. There's mounting evidence that mere acquisition of facts and abstract principles is far from enough to produce an educated person. For one thing, the body of fact, particularly in the sciences, is multipl multiplying at a dazzling rate. Intellectual capital acquired during college and even graduate school years must be continually reinvested and augmented if one is to maintain effectiveness in the profession. A person who is expecting or who is expected to continue to learn throughout his active life must free himself from reliance upon the teacher and the digested texts and, and uh, perfect at least some of the tools of independent study. And another quotation. Indeed, it is difficult to see how an individual can make much way in the knowledge-based world of the immediate future unless he is a perpetual learner. Emphasis on teaching an individual how to learn rather than on communication of knowledge calls for educational experience to be an increasingly individual experience. Uh, Alan, Alvin Toffler, you know, his book, The Future Shock, uh, wrote an essay, some of you may have seen it, I think it's in, it's either in uh, PTA magazine, one of the, one of the educational uh, journals. Anyway, it's, it's a selection from his, a book that's coming out next month, I think, called Education in the Future. And he, one of his major points in this is just that, that education has got to be for the future. It's fine for, to teach people the, our heritage and so forth, but we have to train people to be able to cope with the future. And this is one of the things I think that colleges have to do, and one of the reasons that I think use, learning how to use the library and being able to use it well is ter terribly important. Okay, now, what I'm saying is that the library and the sort of situation that the college a liberal arts college is, is, to, is a crucial kind of thing, but not in the ways that libraries are traditionally thought of. Um, don't think that I'm what is a, a library college, that expression, library college devotee. You know the group, the library college group. <clears throat> it's a term that means different things to different people, but essentially it means uh, absorbing librarians into the teaching faculty. And by the teaching faculty, I mean those people who are in the classrooms, as opposed to librarians, who I also consider faculty, but who do not teach in a classroom situation. The library college means absorbing librarians into the teaching faculty, or vice versa, that is, uh, absorbing the teaching faculty into the library. And this combined group, freed from the publish or perish syndrome, freed from the mundane tasks, such as cataloging or circulating books, uh, devote full time to educating students. This is the library college concept, and it's a concept that was perhaps initiated by Louis Shores and uh, Robert Jordan, who's in the Federal City College now. Um, it's a group that had a good bit of influence, made a lot of people think and talk, 
Uh, but I don't. I think it's on its way out. Perhaps because it's it never really got uh, to be to know itself, know where it was going, know exactly what it was doing. There were too many ideas going in too many directions. But it had an influence. It influenced uh, a number of people into thinking about the library as, as more than just a library, but as a crucial part of the educational process. But I believe that the classroom, not just the library, but the classroom or the seminar room or whatever, is still an important place in education. And the librarian's role is primarily in the library, but it should be related to the classroom. And in the process of studying history or English or psychology or biology or whatever, it's important to know how to find information. And this is what I think the librarian's job is, is to teach students how they find out about history or English or whatever. And what we do at Earlham, what we, one of the things we do mostly, and uh, what we're trying to get other people to do is, in a sense, to teach search strategy. Now, those of you who have worked at reference or studied reference uh, know the importance of, of search strategy. And um, students have no concept of the idea. As undergraduate students have no concept of the idea of search strategy. On the other hand, a typical faculty member, someone who's teaching in one of the disciplines, knows search strategy but doesn't know really that it's search strategy. He knows how to find things, and he's developed his own search strategy. Yet he cannot convey this to his students. If a student asks him, uh, I need some information on a particular topic, they'll say, well, look in such and such book, this particular book or that particular book. But he cannot tell a student, well, you ought to begin with an encyclopedia or a handbook, and then you ought to go to the card catalog, and then you ought to go here, 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 and then these are the ways of finding out information. He's so expert at it that it's become part of his thinking and can't really explain it to students. But I think it's important for librarians to be able to teach undergraduates, and certainly graduate students, search strategy. And that, of course, differs from field to field, uh, from discipline to discipline. Well, librarians know that this kind of thing, that this, this place of the library in the, in the uh, undergraduate curriculum is important. I hope they do anyway, uh, but they've not really been able to, to implement it, and librarians, college librarians, uh, and uh, when I talk about librarians, I use the term librarians here, I'm using it in the context of this particular talk and talking about college librarians. Most college librarians feel really kind of impotent, feel left out of the educational, of what's really going on at the, in, in education. Uh, obviously, they're part of a college, but uh, they're not central to it as they as they hope they would be. And all you uh, need to do is read uh, George Whitbeck's little book uh, called "The uh, Influence of Librarians in Liberal Arts Colleges in Selected Decision Making Areas." It's a uh, dismaying kind of um, book. <clears throat> it was published last in '72, and. Uh, it's a short book. It's about 140 pages, but only about 50 pages of text, most of its tables. It's really just a long article, but a good one. And uh, what it does is to show how librarians feel inadequate in the, the whole situ higher educational situation. It's an old story, as he points out. Librarians are the last to hear about what's going on in the college, uh, even those things that directly concern the library. They may come through the news, through a newsletter, or somewhere else. Well, why? Why aren't librarians considered more important? The libraries certainly are. Uh, every, any college that you go to will mention, oh yes, of course, the library. Sure, the library is the center of the institution. Uh, but the librarians are not generally regarded this way. Why aren't they? Well, I have an answer, which I'll get to later on. But keep that question in mind. Why aren't librarians really regarded very much? Uh, why aren't they thought of? Why aren't they consulted? Why aren't they uh, at the heart of the, of the educational process? First, let me talk about some, some uh, typical problems and uh, why they can be solved or why they don't present any, any uh, serious obstacles. The 
major problem or a major problem of libraries and one that's discussed all the time of course is finances. College libraries have traditionally been poorly supported. If you look at the statistics put out by the <coughs> Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, you can find a considerable range of uh, expenditures for college libraries, ranging from $10 per full-time equivalent student a year, which is a terribly low amount, uh, in smaller colleges around the country, to um, $750 a year per full-time equivalent of the student, which is the figure for Yale University. Uh, that enormous range, $10 per student to $750 per student. Or you find, to use the uh, different scale, that's used the percentage spent by an educational institution for its educational and general expenditures. This is the standard figure. It ranges from 1%, sometimes even less than 1% of that total college budget to 9 or 10% of that total college budget. Again, an enormous range. The average for colleges throughout the country is a 3.7% figure. That is, three, the average college spends 3.7% of its total educational and general budget for its library. Now, the, the basic figure recommended by the Association of College and Research Libraries is, is 5%. But even the average is quite a bit below this, and there are very few places that spend what is considered the standard. Even a list of 30 selected colleges, there's a list that's collected each year by Bowdoin College, uh, get comparative statistics. Even those 30 selected colleges, these are some of the more prestigious colleges around the country, showed only half of them reaching this 5% figure. Well, why? what are the problems? You know, why are libraries supported that well? Obviously, there are the rising costs, these pressures on colleges from all, all parts of the colleges. And the only hope here, and it's, this is a long, it, it's not just inflation, College libraries have long gotten very poor support. The only hope here is the realization that uh, they must be supported if they're going to be effective. And hopefully this kind of thing is happening. The Carnegie Commission report, you know, the Carnegie Commission on Higher Education, which has been coming out over the past year or two with a number of series, a number of different reports. In one of the reports called Reform on Campus, um, said this, and the, I'm quoting this because the Carnegie Commission is a prestigious group, and uh, when it says something, it, uh, people listen. Library, libraries are usually looked upon as rather passive centers on the campus, places where books are kept and where students can study. They can, and in some places, do play a more active role. To take a more active role, the library will need more than the standard 3 to 4 percent of the budget for general and instructional expense, perhaps as large as 6 or 8 percent. That's quite a jump. That's twice as much as they're getting. And its recommendation, recommendation number 12 in the book, is that the library should become a more active participant in the instructional process with an added proportion of funds, perhaps as much as doubling. Now, I can't be terribly optimistic that this is going to happen, certainly in any in the near future, but uh, there is a growing recognition of the need, and um, hopefully it will happen over the, the next few years. And also, I think that <clears throat> one of the reasons that libraries have not been terribly well supported is they haven't, uh, as wheels of the institution, they haven't squeaked enough, and the, the squeaking wheel does get the grease. Libraries are just librarians are just going to have to be more forceful in, in requesting funds. But they'll have to do this based on what they're doing. Okay, finances is one problem. Another problem is the is the collection. The basic problem is here. How can a small library, that is in a liberal arts college, with a small collection do the kinds of things that a library ought to be doing? 
in all institutions of higher education, the median collection is about 50,000 volumes. And that includes two-year colleges, too. But in four-year institutions, the median collection is still less than 100,000 volumes. So it's not a very good situation. With 100,000 volumes in a, in a library, you can't really, for today's, the kind of, of breadth and depth that students need, you can't really do very much. Even at, uh, at Earl, which I consider a pretty good collection, we have a, a collection of 200,000 volumes, but it's still not enough, not for our instructional purposes. Well, how then is a library going to cope? How is it going to meet the needs of students with a limited kind of, of collection? Well, there are the obvious answers, microforms. And as this field becomes uh, more standardized, uh, it becomes more useful. And uh, anybody who's looked at the what's available on microforms, has come into availability on microforms in the last few years, can see that this is one of the things that libraries can do. Those, most of you are probably familiar with the, uh, the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica microbooks. These enormous collections of uh, 25,000 volumes or so in a space this size. Well, these are great things. And as that kind of thing gets developed, and libraries will be able to, to acquire that much less expensively than they could books. So microform is one small portion of the answer to how a library develops its collection. Another thing is the interlibrary loan. Um, Last year, I guess, uh, Fred Kilgore spoke to you about OCLC, the Ohio College Library uh, Conference, uh, Ohio College Library Center. And uh, in that, the, the concept of the, Ohio, of the OCLC is a wonderful thing, because there are the, every college, or almost every college and university, and a few public libraries in Ohio, are letting the center know what they have. So anybody in Ohio, and now it's extended to New England, to uh, the Atlanta region, it's going to be extended into Texas, uh, any of these institutions can find out immediately where a particular book is, is located, where a particular book or periodical is located. A great thing for, for expediting uh, in a library loan. With that kind of thing, and the development of long distance facsimile transmission, kind of thing you see advertised, only advertised now, a uh, few places have it, uh, by Xerox, whereby you can transmit uh, reproductions of print over telephone lines. With that kind of thing uh, becoming much less expensive than it is now, this will mean that any library can, can get copy, hard copy, of uh, any book it wants from anywhere in a very short period of time. So there's another possibility for expanding one's collection. There are other kinds of things that, they, that have been done. Uh, the colleges and uh, small universities in Connecticut at one time, I'm not sure if they still have it, hired an interlibrary loan librarian to stay at Yale University Library just so that interlibrary, interlibrary loan librarian could service them as they request things. There are a number of of working situations whereby interlibrary loan works very fast. Some of you may know of the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago, which does this for a number of larger universities and some college libraries too. So there are all kinds of possibilities for interlibrary loan, another way of expanding the, the resources available to students. Uh, travel. Students are much more willing to travel than they used to be. Our students come, uh, come to Ball State, go to Miami University, they go to Indianapolis, even to Bloomington. If they know that a particular book or periodicals are there, then they need to use them. And this is a fairly common thing. Cooperative purchasing is another possibility for this kind of thing. Uh, here, geography is a problem. Uh, the only places where it's really productive, where it's really feasible, are places like the, the Dayton area, the Miami Valley, uh, whereby a number of institutions in a radius of 25 miles or so have agreed to to buy certain things. But these are just some ways of looking toward uh, libraries expanding their resources. I also don't happen to believe that a, a 
college library's collection needs to just keep growing and growing. The figure used to be what, eh? That uh, the library's collection expanded every 50, doubled every 15 years? Well, I, I don't really believe that's necessary, even if it were possible. I, I just don't think that a college library needs a collection of over, I, just to pull a figure out of the air as I have, uh, 350,000 volumes. This is plenty. Given these other kinds of possibilities, that is interlibrary loan and microform and so on, the figure of 350,000 volumes from almost any liberal arts college, I think is enough. But I'm assuming here a couple of things. And one very important thing is that the collection is weeded. And not very many colleges, unfortunately, weed their collections. Uh, in the last seven years, since we've kept statistics on it, we've thrown out 20,000 volumes. That is one tenth of our present collection has just been discarded because it's just no longer useful enough to make it worthwhile keeping. So, I'm saying that 350,000 volumes is enough. And uh, with these other kinds of possibilities, college libraries can have adequate collections. Okay. Let me go to another problem, and that is the problem of processing materials. This is always a problem for smaller libraries. After all, to, to catalog uh, one book, uh, or just a few books a year, you may need exactly the same kinds of materials to catalog uh, many times that number of books. Uh, that is, you may need the British Museum catalog or, or some other very specialized things, even if you're only cataloging a small number of things. You need the same expertise as a larger library. So the, the problem has been a severe one for smaller libraries because most of the materials are not difficult to catalog, but for those few fairly esoteric things, those the small number of foreign language things, you've had to have uh, catalogers who can do the job. Perhaps uh, the college libraries have had a uh, smaller number of foreign language publications, but still, it's been a problem. This is really the easiest one to solve, but still I find very few college librarians who recognize it or have taken advantage of it. And the, the way it's been solved, of course, is by um, the plans for the use of mark tapes and the plans by various commercial organizations and others to make use of those mark tapes and to do the cataloging for people. I found I was uh, working as a consultant for a library in Pennsylvania a couple of years ago. And in his technical processing area, he had a space. This is a library, a library oh, for a, a college about the size of ours. That is about uh, 1,200 or 1,400 students, something like that, with a collection of uh, maybe 300 or 400,000 volumes for the whole building. The building was built for that future collection. And yet he had spaces in his technical processing area for something like eight or 10 catalogs. I said, well, that's crazy. You don't need all that space then. You could eliminate uh, two or 3,000 square feet immediately. Well, he insisted on it. What he couldn't see, of course, was that there were the catalogers and small institutions were, would almost become a uh, superfluous. And I've seen this happen at, uh, because of OCLC again in Ohio, uh, Hiram College, again, where I did some some work has almost eliminated its cataloging, almost completely. They had one cataloger who's doing, who's working maybe five or six hours a week cataloging. The rest of the time she's doing reference work. Because the OCLC is so versatile, it's uh, so quick, so correct, that you, the catalogers don't have to, to worry about it. All they do is punch in the book numbers, and they get back the catalog cards all alphabetized, all ready to be filed. Indiana and Illinois are investigating the same kind of thing as OCLC, a bibliographic center that hopefully will do this. But if the states don't do it, there are commercial organizations that, that uh, are doing it. Some of you may have seen the advertisements from Richard Abel or from Baker and Taylor. Now, book supplies, people who are in the book supply business originally, but are now selling, along with their books, sets of catalog cards done to your format. You want LC, Dewey, uh, two lines, three lines, however you want it divided, 
Richard Abel has a format that will meet those specifications. Uh, just yesterday, across my desk, came a, a copy of this Humanities, which is a little publication put about by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And it was interesting that they were talking about just this, what they called the revolution that took 500 years. And uh, talking about, in here about uh, cataloging and publication. Um, and how libraries are using it. And the University of Utah's library, an acquisitions librarian, is quoted saying, if we do straight original cataloging, it costs $5.80 a title. With CIP, it costs only $0.75 cents per title. And he estimates that his library is currently saving from twelve to $15,000 a year with CIP. Now, this goes one step further. This means you don't even have to worry about CIP, but Baker and Taylor or Richard Abel or somebody else is doing the cataloging for you. If they can save that much, you think how much a library can save by not even doing any of the cataloging. This then is a disappearing problem, and it'll help alleviate other areas. Okay, another problem. One of personnel. How do you get and keep good personnel? Salaries have always been a problem in college libraries. They're not as large as in university libraries. It's a simple fact. In 1969, the median salary paid to the staff, that is not uh, directors of libraries nor departmental heads, in public universities was $9,200. For private colleges, over 500 for students, it was $7,500. For chief librarians in that same year, the chief librarians of public universities, the median salary was $21,000. For private colleges, the median salary was $11,000. There's not much question about it, that salaries are not just not as uh, competitive uh, with, the, with the university libraries. There are other disadvantages to working in college libraries, the professional contact. Uh, most, most liberal arts colleges are in small towns with just a few staff members, uh, relatively isolated, perhaps uh, fairly conservative communities. Uh, there's a lack of opportunity, a lack of variety of different kinds of jobs. If you're interested in being a serials cataloger, uh, there's no possibility of going to a liberal arts college because they just don't have need for a single serials cataloger. Or if you're interested in a particular type of a particular discipline, um, college libraries don't offer that kind of opportunity, not very many anyway. If you're interested in computers and working with co in a computerized library, that's not very possible in many college libraries. If you're interested in special collections, that's not very possible in many college libraries. So that um, the limitations of working in a college library are, are, a, uh, are severe. That, uh, the security of working in a in a college library is perhaps not as great, or most people don't think it's as great. And as colleges are in a shaky financial position, well, that's I mean, look what happened at the librarians at the University of Chicago recently. What was it, six or seven of them just being dismissed like so? And there are limited facilities at a um, at a college library, but there are lots of positive things. Um, if you like working on a variety of things, college library is great. You know, you can do reference, you can do circulation if you want, you can catalog, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, if you like to be close to books, and this is the reason I went into library work, and I suspect it's the reason a lot of people go into library work, because they like to be close to books, and they like books. I remember visiting the University of California some years ago in the library and talking to a kid who had just graduated from library school and was working in the Berkeley Library, and uh, I asked him what he was doing. He said he was stamping invoices. <clears throat> I thought, well, gee, that's a terrible thing. But here's a guy who went into library work probably because he liked books and is put there just stamping invoices going through the library. <coughs> well, in that kind of library, they needed somebody who just did that. But um, well, that wasn't for me. It's a chance, if you're working in a college library, to do things on your own. Uh, to try new things. In a university library, this isn't nearly as possible because uh, it's too easy. There are routines, there are structures, and it, it's not very difficult, not very easy to break out of those things. There's a lack of bureaucracy in college libraries. <clears throat> there are some financial benefits to working in college libraries. In my own situation, for example, uh, my children have a, uh, I get tuition remission 
my children. My children can go to Earlham College free, or they can go to other colleges, and Earlham will pay uh, up to a certain amount for their tuition. A lot of colleges have this kind of benefit, and other kinds of benefits. This is a real financial benefit in my particular case. Uh, the quality of life in a college community is sometimes better. You know, in smaller towns, there's a community. You can, I can bicycle to work very quickly. And the salaries in, are becoming more competitive. And most important in a college library is the kind of intimacy wow. one has with college students. Um, I happen to like college students, and that's uh, one of the reasons I, I went into a college library. But I work closely with students, and I wouldn't give, give that up for anything. Uh, I enjoy working, helping students. And in a university library, not very many people can do this. When I worked at Emory University Library, I enjoyed my work very much, but I felt that kind of lack that I hardly ever saw any students, and I never realized what was happening to the materials that I was processing. They were coming into the library, they were going through my hands, and somewhere somebody was making use of them, but I didn't know how. So that there is the advantage, and I think the real advantage in a college library of working closely with the, with the public, in this case, particularly students. Another problem in libraries is the, is the one of, of status. And here, this, uh, going back to Whitbeck's book, uh, that librarians feel left out. They are left out. And this is the whole thrust of his book. I'm quoting him for a moment. Their lack of involvement in curricular decision-making would would seem to make clear their distance from achieving any sort of professional status as faculty members. And again, the librarian's role becomes largely that of a clerk whose work centers on routines of book ordering, organizing, and locating within a frame set for him by the college curriculum. That's a dismay kind of, uh, of observation. This is the way many librarians feel about their own status in their own college communities. Now, there are exceptions. I know of a number of college librarians who play key roles in their particular institutions. And a very obvious one comes to mind. This is uh, Charlie Bennett, uh, Father Bennett uh, up at St. Joseph's College, who was librarian there and is now president of, uh, of St. Joseph's. But this is not the time to, to talk of the pros and cons of, of status, of tenure, of, uh, of faculty rank or status for librarians. But if librarians are going to claim either, that is, either uh, tenure or faculty status, they must play a more, a more important role. But if they don't have any status, how are they going to play that role? That is, as Whitbeck says, it's a vicious circle. And without some effort to break out of it, passive library service and low faculty and administrations and expectations of the library, the library will remain a peripheral agency in the institution it is set up to serve. That is, the libraries, librarians are in a vicious circle. They don't have much status, so they don't get much respect. They don't get much respect, so they don't have much status. They don't get much respect, they don't do anything, and it keeps going around and around. How do you break out of this? I think you can uh, achieve status, and I'm getting to my major point, through, the, through fulfilling educational role of the library. And this is the, the, another problem. What is the educational role of the library in the college? This is perhaps the most difficult one of these problems I mentioned to identify because it means so many different things to so, so many different people. Now, <coughs> I'll pause for a moment. The basic purpose of a college library is to provide the, the books and materials, other materials, supporting the academic program of the college. But this is only the basic purpose, and any worthwhile college library must do a lot more than this. 
its, co its collection should also represent the, the breadth of our intellectual and cultural heritage, and it should provide an adequate selection of materials for recreational reading and for students who may want to investigate topics not specifically related to the curriculum. That's pretty much, Jenny, you can find a similar kind of statement in Guy Lyle's administration of the college library. It should also make available to students and faculty resources outside the library and should, without great inconvenience to its own clientele, permit the library's resources to be used by the wider community. That is, the college library ought to be available, not just to the college, but to people who live around it. The library's processing of materials should be efficient in terms of time and usefulness, and its physical facilities should provide easy access in using the collection, plus comfortable and pleasant surroundings for study and leisure reading. All of these qualities, however, are part of the responsive, the traditional role of the library. That is, if fulfilled, they add up to the library's providing good service and appropriate materials when asked. An active library, as opposed to a responsive library. An active library, on the other hand, is not satisfied to merely wait for users. It should publicize new resources and services, acting as an information center for the entire community, for students, for faculty and administration. It should encourage not just use of the library, but intelligent, effective use of the library. But no matter how good the collection is, no matter how attractive and comfortable the library's facilities are, how well organized the bibliographical apparatus is, Unless the library is being used effectively, the library staff isn't really doing its job. And ensuring effective use means that the library will become an integral part of the educational program, and that the library staff will be regarded as important to the teaching and learning process as classroom teachers. And if these requirements are met, then the cliche that the library is the heart of the college, that's a phrase that you can find in many college catalogs, uh, will not be just a cliché. Okay, so my point is here that the library, if it's going to break out of this uh, stereotype, this image that it has, that has led to so many of these other problems, has got to perform a more important educational role. And I've tried to define a little bit what I mean about that educational role. Now, here, in, its, in this educational role, the College Library has a, an extraordinary opportunity because of all kinds of academic libraries, College Libraries should find it easiest to achieve their purpose. Their manageable size, their nice size to run, it, that should permit a focus on the kind and the level of materials they acquire and distribute, and the relative clarity of institutional goals. That is, most colleges have a pretty good idea of their mission. They know what they're trying to do, as they're to educate, what kind of students they're trying to turn out. And having that kind of objective in mind is very important, because the institution, the institution knows where it's going, the library knows what its mission is. So those inst having those institutional goals clear should point out more or less precisely the kinds of services they perform. Their personnel, library personnel, college library personnel, is almost always deeply dedicated, many of them there for religious sectarian reasons, of what the college is. They're therefore they're deeply dedicated, not merely to the profession and to the needs of their immediate clientele groups, but to the, to the academic and social objectives of their particular institutions. And their students and faculty comprise a clientele who are, for the most part, captive, and with whom the library can establish almost any relationship, any in kind, and in depth, any kind of points. And yet, despite the fact that there is this kind of ideal possible situation, can anyone say that college libraries are really doing the kind of job that they ought to be doing? Well, I don't think anyone, anyone can say that. Now, <clears throat> all of the, these problems that I've discussed here are uh, well known. Uh, the role, the role of the library uh, in, in the education. Well, maybe I, let me talk about that a moment. This idea of library instruction. Uh, when I talk about library instruction, 
or in instruction in library use. I'm not talking about library orientation. And this is what most people almost immediately assume. I don't mean taking the students around the first day of the term and showing them here's the card catalog and uh, there's the circulation desk and the restrooms are up there and you can smoke here and so forth. That's not what I mean at all. What I mean by uh, instruction in library use is showing students how to make the most effective use of the library. There are a variety of ways of doing this and different institutions now are trying different ways. Uh, there's computer-assisted instruction. The University of Denver is doing some very interesting things with this. Uh, some of you may have seen the Pathfinders that are being published by Addison Wesley, which is a, uh, a printed material that shows students search strategy. Uh, at, uh, at Earlham, what we try to use is a combination of course-related lectures or discussions throughout college, not just in freshman composition class, but in freshman classes and sophomore general courses and seminars, every possible class where the students are going to use the library. We think it's tremendously important that students know the bibliographical apparatus for that particular course. And we have, you know, science, freshman science students using the Science Citation Index. And I told the people at Science Citation Index that we had freshmen using it. They were amazed course is made for for research scholars but the it's a very useful kind of thing and the uh, the students gain a tremendous amount from this it has certain fringe benefits too which we had never anticipated because the students for the most students come to college with a very bad image of the library they've had very bad experiences in uh, or should they very bad they've had poor experiences in in high school and in public <coughs> libraries and they're Libraries to them are something you go to when you, if you have to, you go to pick up a reserve book or you go to study, but you don't really go to get help. And one of the things we've been able to do through this kind of library instruction program is to turn this image around. So because we go to the classes or we bring the classes into the library and talk to the students about the kinds of papers they're doing we talk about the kinds of bibliographies and indexes that are most meaningful to them at that time. They know that we are aware of their problems, that we are knowledgeable in their fields, and that we're willing to help. And so we, we've made a, created an entirely different image of the library for the, uh, for the undergraduates. So here, the, in giving this kind of library instruction is, is uh, this is a very useful kind of thing to do, and as I say, it helps to identify, to promote the role of the library in, uh, in the educational process. I think it's an exciting, one of the most exciting developments is, as I said, it's the thing that I'm perhaps most interested in, in libraries, because I think this is really where the library should be. Well, all these, these problems that I've, I've discussed are, are fairly well known, and the answers perhaps are not so well known. But there's one problem college libraries have that I've not mentioned that's not of their own making, not at all. And even worse, not only is it not of their own making, most colleges don't even know it's a problem. And yet, to me, it's the most significant problem because it has so many ramifications, touching in, in one way or another all these other problems I discussed above. And this factor is what I call the uh, the university library syndrome. That's university hyphen library syndrome. It's a pattern of attitudes which causes, which cause college faculty, administrators, and librarians to think of their libraries in terms of university libraries, and thus to imitate their practices, attitudes, and objectives. So many college faculty members suffer from this syndrome, and it's especially true of newer, younger faculty. Uh, let me just repeat what I, what I said there. The, the, what the university library syndrome is, is a way of thinking about college libraries in terms of university libraries. That all a college library is is a smaller university library. It has the same kind of purpose. Most faculty members, certainly the newer faculty members, think of college libraries in these terms. Time after time, prospective college faculty members come to Earl, many of whom later on turn out to be excellent teachers, ask me about our library. You know, but those questions are almost invariably, uh, invariably about reserve book procedures, 
how you order materials, what's the size of the collection, can I borrow books on interlibrary loan, uh, can my wife borrow books, or can my children borrow books. Rarely does a new faculty member ever ask questions in terms of how students use the library, and certainly never in terms of what the library staff is doing to contribute to the teaching program, other than, of course, of supplying materials. The assumption such faculty members make is that all the teaching takes place in the classroom, and the library is there if the students are sent to it. Now, what else can one expect? After all, these, these faculty are, in many cases, junior members of their disciplines, often only recently out of graduate school, and they view the college library's relationship to their teaching, much as they view their university library's relationship to their graduate studies. And the graduate schools, as you know, have been responsible for the poor quality of undergraduate teaching in this country. Their emphasis on research coming from the German university system has, been, uh, has had a disastrous effect on undergraduate teaching. Uh, Last week, I ran across an article in the uh, Journal of Higher Education, <clears throat> which made this point beautifully. Uh, and this is, this is written by a, um, a professor of political science at uh, Franklin and Marshall College. And he talks about just this kind of thing, the attitude of a, of a, um, a young faculty member at a college where teaching is supposed to be important. Uh, and what his feelings were. He says, in 1965, when fresh out of graduate school, I joined the faculty of a small, well-regarded liberal arts college. Not the least of my reasons for doing so was the prospect that such a position seemed to hold. From this position, I could realize my ultimate ambition of someday joining a respectable graduate faculty, which placed high premium on scholarship and research. I had, after all, been trained by scholars whom I respected deeply and wished to emulate. Like the overwhelming majority of my colleagues who joined the faculty at about that time, I counted myself fortunate indeed to have won a position at a school that we all agreed was a good one to move from. Our lunchroom conversation was heavily laced with fantasies of someday being raided by the universities into whose graduate faculties we all plan to publish our way. In the meantime, we prepared ourselves as best we could by practicing on our students making as many of our courses as much like graduate seminars as possible and treating our students as much like graduate students as they would let us. That was a, it's a very candid, the only really candid statement I've seen on this in a long time. So that's a, that's a real problem. And as I say, someone like that who looks upon teaching undergraduates as you teach graduate students, how else can you expect them to look at the library? library serves his students and himself just as the university library did. Okay. So the faculty members academic background and training work against an understanding of the proper role of the college library. He's been trained as a scholar researcher and is not really interested in how his students use the library. He after all learned to use it in his discipline he assumes the students can. Moreover if students need help they can either come to him and he'll recommend titles they should use or they can of course ask the reference librarian. Rarely does it occur to him that learning how to use the library intelligently and independently is not only a desirable part of the educational process, but it will also permit students to do better work for them. And certainly the idea that anyone can lead students through the intricacies of his discipline's materials, that's completely foreign to him. Similarly, his selection of library materials is based primarily on the scholarly reviews. And so he requests specialized monographs, sets of primary sources, and foreign language commentaries, which the scholarly journals uh, emphasize. Unfortunately, Choice Magazine is doing a magnificent job in this case and helping faculty members choose better things because Choice has become recognized by many college faculty as doing a good job of, review of reviewing and for college libraries. No one who's serious about Higher education would deny the importance of the scholarly kinds of things for college libraries, but too often they were purchased at the expense of materials that were less sophisticated, less complicated, uh, but uh, more appropriate for undergraduates. So the, the teaching faculty's lack of confidence in their librarians as colleagues in the educational process as another unfortunate consequence. The librarian's role is viewed as a passive one, one devoted to housekeeping, to getting materials quickly, and 
here again, these are the kinds of things the university library does. Get materials quickly, make them accessible with dispatch and efficiency, and to having making them available when needed for answering questions, compiling bibliographies, or putting materials on reserve. This is what librarians are for, for running these kinds of errands. Uh, deans and presidents, most of whom have come from faculty ranks and are prone to the same kinds of attitudes, want their librarians to, quote, run a tight ship. Uh, and I've, I've had this ex exact expression used many times by business managers and by, by presidents. Uh, they want them to keep their accounts balanced, to make sure that all student assistants and clerical help are working hard, and to answer the needs of the departments, to keep things calm, not to get any departments upset. Whether the college's students are really deriving much benefit from the library is really questioned. As long as faculty members don't complain, as long as the size of the collection and other standards meet a level acceptable to accrediting agencies, the administration is happy to let the library alone. And unfortunately, really, too many librarians like it that way. But why, is, why are librarians like it this way? Why are they caught in the same kind of syndrome? Why haven't more of them been able to focus on the, the special mission of the undergraduate library? Just as many college lib as many college teachers, though certainly still not enough, have been able to focus on their mission, that is, teaching of undergraduates rather than on research. Is it simply a response to what librarians think faculty and administrators think of them? Partly, but there are other reasons. Part of this is for the, the, uh, the fact that university librarians are the image, the outlook of university librarians are constantly impressed upon college librarians. The university librarians are the most visible. They're the spokesmen for the, for the profession. They're the editors of the journals. They're the ones who are the heads of the, uh, of the associations. Uh, they write most of the books and articles. Uh, they're um, it's quite understandable. They're more articulate, they travel more widely, they have a greater breadth of experience, they possess more academic credentials, and they have more time because they have larger staffs and they're free you know, to wander around and be head of ALA or whatever. But college librarians and college librarians are not, are not they can't do this. Uh, if I said to, by some act of God, I uh, ALA said, you want to be president next year? Uh, the president of our institute would say, I'm sorry, but you've got to run that library. <laughs> so the uh, university librarians do tend to dominate the academic library scene and uh, set its tone. Hopefully this is changing for some of the reasons I've mentioned above. Another influence is that so many college librarians either began their experience and or uh, uh, worked for a long time in university libraries and uh, by uh, osmosis or whatever way or, uh, got the became prone to the same kind of, uh, of thought pattern of what university libraries are for and then after they go into college libraries they just carry this thought pattern with them. Now I'm not saying here that you know that you shouldn't that a college library shouldn't hire anybody who worked in a university library before that'd be ridiculous because having that kind of breadth of experience, that, that access to uh, scholarly collections, that association of different kinds of scholars is very important, particularly for college libraries. But that mindset that I'm talking about, that, uh, that creates a kind of a passive library, is a very unfortunate thing. And that ought to be recognized and be deplored. And I don't think the library schools have done very much in this kind of thing in emphasizing the educational role of, a li of libraries. If, for example, in, uh, in a reference course, I, I, maybe you shouldn't listen to what I'm saying right now, uh, the, the, um, the real appeal, or the way reference courses have always been taught in the past, of course, is to be able to answer questions, to compile bibliography. My own feeling is that the, what a reference course really ought to teach is a search strategy. And that, uh, and the reference interview, the importance of the reference interview. And these two things, being able to get across to undergraduates what search strategy is, and to be able to relate to an, inter to a, a, uh, an undergraduate across or on the side of that reference desk is a very important kind of thing. Uh, learning the reference works is fine, but uh, you don't remember them terribly long. And the only way you really get to know them is by working with them. 
but the getting the process of reference work is the to me the really important thing. Not too long ago, Guy Lyle, when uh, when he was preparing a new edition of his administration of the college library, which will be coming out this year, asked me for the names of some college libraries that were doing exciting, innovating, innovative kind of things. It was hard for me to really think of any, and it occurred to me then how far ahead of college libraries the public libraries are in imaginative programs that reach out to their publics, even though the college library's clientele is so handy and so much more identifiable. Why don't college libraries serve their communities, their administrators, their staffs, and their families, as well as students? Compare, just for example, the browsing areas of any college library with any small, with a good college library, what are considered to be a good college library, with good public library. You see a browsing area different than is with colleges and their libraries. But there is no question, on the other hand, that one of the reasons is the same, and that is the emphasis, the the tendency to try to emulate the university. This has sufficient impact on both the college faculty and on the college libraries. Now, insofar as college teaching has been concerned, this detrimental effect has been recognized, and a variety of corrective approaches have been suggested and are being tried. There's a lot of talk on approving undergraduate teaching. But the university's impact on college libraries has not been recognized. College libraries are quite different, and this is my point, that college libraries are quite different from university libraries, not only in quantitative terms, but in their educational roles. They have their own goals and purposes and unique opportunities to achieve them. And only if this difference, the difference between a university and a college library is kept in mind, can college librarians work successfully toward these goals.